Hi, everyone. Um, the title of my talk today is uh, Layer 2, a Pessimist Guide. So this takes some explaining. Um, we all know that Layer 2 brings about many benefits like scalability, privacy, and latency. And in fact, in my job, I work, um, I work directly on this. I do research and development for a company called L4 on state channels. And in March, uh, I co-authored a paper called Counterfactual Generalized State Channels. And I also follow ongoing plasma research. So really focus on Layer 2. So, why am I giving this a talk titled "Layer to a Pessimist Guide" today? I'm hoping to um, I'm hoping to present to to teach to present what are the strongest attacks I know against Layer Two. What are the tightest limits against their scalability? So in this talk, I'm going to go through um, some sp uh, specific constructions um, regarding state channels and state channel networks, specific attacks, and I'll move on to talking about. What kind, of, uh, what kind of limits apply to all layer two systems. So before I go into specific constructions, um, it would be good to define layer two systems. So layer two, I generally mean things like state channels and plasma and things like that. And unfortunately, those things themselves don't have very good definitions. But one definition I heard from uh, Vitalik somewhere sometime in March, which, is, uh, which I think is quite good and will work for this talk, is that a layer two system is when a smart contract sets up a game whose expected outcome can be changed with a small number of on-chain transactions. So to kind of explain this definition, um, we can unpack three important phrases here. So when I say set up a game, it means that it implements the payoff table, the payoff matrix for some game, and a game in the game theory kind of sense. Um, expected outcome, which means how people will behave, like how ex participants in the game are expected to behave. For example, it could be what is the Nash equilibrium of the game. And when we say a small number of uh, on-chain transactions, it basically means we compare how many on-chain transactions, two quantities. The first quantity is um, the number of on-chain transactions required to kind of progress the state of layer two. And the other quantity is what is the, how much does the state of the layer two system change? So uh, the next section of my talk, I'm gonna talk a lot about state channels. So this fits into um, kind of the first, the first line you see over there, to make where there's zero on-chain transactions needed to make most changes in a payment or a state channel. So I'm gonna dive right in into the first part of my talk, how stuff works, and um, I don't have time to cover all the designs that um, we know about. Like, um, so I'm just gonna talk about pay specifically state channels, state channel networks, payment channels, and uh, uh, explain how these work in order to set up, in order to explain how specific attacks against them work. So let's jump into uh, payment channels. So this is gonna go uh, quickly because I, I understand this is a pretty technical audience. So in a payment channel, let's say we have, in this case we have two participants, uh, Bob and Alice. Um, Alice owns a poutine store. Um, Bob wants to buy poutine and they both own 10 ETH and so the idea behind payment channels is instead of sending the money um, directly in an on-chain transaction from Bob to Alice, what we can do is that both of them can send their 10 Ether into a, a special smart contract on-chain, and the smart contract will record the kind of balance assigned to each player. So in this case, Bob should have 10 Ether and Alice has 10 Ether. When Bob decides to pay Alice one Ether in order to buy some poutine, um, what they do is they compute the new state of kind of what is the new state of things after this transaction. So if one ether is transferred, Bob should have ownership of nine ether and Alice should have ownership of 11 ether. So they exchange cryptographic signatures on this message, which has the new state, as well as the sequence number of one. So after, immediately after this message is signed, we consider the payment finalized and it is safe for Alice to provide the routine to Bob. So I'm gonna explain how the security of this system is enforced. So if we have many payments, if we end up in a state where many payments have been exchanged, where we are going to have many signed messages, in this case, three signed messages, each with an increasing sequence number and each with a different kind of state of how much does Bob own and how much does Alice own. So the rule for the smart contract um, in which we have stored our 20 ETH is this. Um, both parties can finalize the contract by submitting the latest state. So in this case, they both agree that the message number with the message with sequence number three is the latest, the most, you know, the latest signed message. And then the smart contract can go ahead and disperse the funds to both of them. And we, in order to really ensure security, we need to go through the case where one party isn't responsive. So what I mean by this is, um, let's say Alice, Alice wants to get her money back, but Bob is um, maybe offline. 
So in this case, the smart contract implements the rule whereby Alice can say that this is the latest state, and the contract has to confirm that it is indeed the latest state, so it enters a waiting period. Um, and if no one submits newer state at the end of the waiting period, where newer means with a higher sequence number, then the contract can, pay, can uh, assume that this is indeed the latest state, and the contract can pay out 15 ETH to Bob and 5 ETH to Alice. So I'm going to quickly go through how um, state, state channels generalize this. So in, in the kind of the system that uh, I described here, the off-chain messages and kind of the state is two numbers, Bob's balance and Alice's balance. So state channels kind of allow us to um, uh, generalize this to different forms of state. So for example, if uh, Alice and Bob want to enter a chess game with each other, so um, for example, they want to say that the winner of this particular chess game gets 20 ETH. This is an example of an application that will work on a state channel. So in this case, the state instead of balances will be the state of a chessboard, so like a, you know, eight squares by eight squares. And in this case, if Bob, let's say it's Bob's turn, let's say this is the current state of the chessboard, what Bob does is um, produces a new message and kind of, you can see that one particular piece has moved if you look closely. Um, with, and this thing has a higher sequence number, so both of them can sign it, and so on and so forth. So that's, uh, that's a quick explain, uh, explanation of how state channels work. Um, the next thing I'll talk about is uh, channel networks, or specifically payment channel networks. So payment channel networks are based on the kind of insight that, um, well, let's consider this situation where we have an Alice Ingrid channel on chain, and we also have an Ingrid Bob channel on chain, but this is the only, these are the only channels we have. Um, Alice and Bob have not opened a channel with each other. So the insight here is that if, let, let's say in the Alice Ingrid um, channel, Alice owns two ETH and Ingrid owns two ETH, um, and similarly for the Ingrid Bob channel, the insight is that if Alice can somehow pay one ETH to Ingrid and then Ingrid pays one ETH to Bob, we end up in a situation where Ingrid um, ownership of Ether hasn't changed, but Alice has kind of transferred uh, one ETH to Bob. And then, um, well, we can keep doing this, and there's ways to make this kind of trustless that I won't go over today. And for completeness, um, we can also kind of, I'll go through quickly how state channel networks um, operate. So um, if we have this, if we go back to this situation again, um, kind of what I set up, uh, said before, um, the, the question we, we might want to ask is, um, can Alice and Bob enter a contract, i.e. not just pay each other, but enter some kind of contract, for example, a chess game, without any on-chain transactions? So with payment channels, we found that Alice can pay Bob if the intermediary Ingrid kind of locks up, uses, uses her, her capital as collateral to, to kind of facilitate the payment. So state channel networks um, are a class of mechanisms that um, that allow us to uh, that, uh, answer this question in the affirmative. So um, I'm going to go through one specific uh, example of the construction. So um, in this case, we see uh, three contracts labeled by uh, the, the, the white boxes are kind of off-chain contracts um, labeled by who, who, who is allowed to change the state of it. So there's an Alice Ingrid, Ingrid Bob, and an Alice Bob. And the Alice Bob contract, um, which again is off-chain, kind of implements the thing that the contract that Alice and Bob have entered with each other. And for the other two, we kind of use them to store collateral. So two ether in the Alice Ingrid channel must be assigned to this contract. And the rule for enforcement is that um, in order to enforce the safety of the, the Alice Bob contract is that um, the Alice Bob contract must be um, capable of being placed on chain, in which case the, the, the AI contract and the IB contract um, are kind of forced to look at the state of the AB contract. So let's say the AB contract says that um, Bob has won the game. So this is the state. Um, Alice owns zero and Bob owns two. Then um, the AI contract sends um, two either to Ingrid and the IB contract sends two either to Bob. And so this is um, all done uh, off-chain. So this is one example of a mechanism for how to do um, state channel networks. So um, kind of Having already known all this, we can already we can already kind of discuss some interesting things. So um, one thing is kind of scalability metrics, right? So we know a lot of people like to talk about transaction measure scalability in transactions per second, mm -hmm. and if we try to kind of 
just naively apply this to this system, we get some weird results. For example, if we look at, um, if we have an Alice Bob payment channel, where, and how this channel is used is that Alice sends one ETH to Bob, and then Bob sends one ETH to Alice, and then Alice sends one ETH to Bob, and then Bob sends one, and then it keeps going back and forth. Um, the, we know that these, uh, these things, like the transaction in this case is simply the exchange of a message. So this is kind of bounded by the network latency. So it can go really high, but it really doesn't, it's not, basically it's not a useful metric in this case. So kind of if we do deploy um, payment channels widely and people rely on it to scale networks, one of the first things that will come up is capacity constraints in the form of how many intermediaries are there, how much capital they have, how expensive is it to lock up your money. So. Um, I don't have a, a complete analysis of how, of how to understand this, but one way to go ab about it is to think about um, payment topologies and capacity to topologies where payment channel networks can help to scale. So the example I gave, um, so if there is a real life example where Alice does want to, where Alice and Bob do want to exchange ETH at a certain, uh, at like a, um, very often, then we know that a channel between them will help. Um, there's another one where Alice wants to send many small payments to Bob, and the payments are kind of small relative to how much they lock up in the channel, and this will um, certainly help. Um, more interesting examples, and if you think about how to, like what's the most general case, um, but this is not the most general case, but like one other interesting example is that if, they, if there's a payment topology where people, where Alice somehow wants to send money to Bob frequently, and and Bob wants to send to Carol and so on and so forth. Like um, you can work out that this this is also a case where payment where you won't run into any kind of uh, capacity constraints, um, and so like it will it will work here. And um, I think the kind of uh, general way to put it is that in in the graph of in the payment graph of who is paying whom, if we can find a subgraph where the payments within the circle are much are much higher in value um, than like higher in value and frequency than the payments crossing the circle, either going in, inside to outside or outside to inside. Then in that case, we know that um, payment channels help scale because we don't run into this capacity constraint. Um, so this is, this is not a talk to go over kind of like the features of state channels, but these are kind of the stuff we are, we're kind of working on, um, uh, like more interesting features for uh, state channels. Um, but so today's talk is about a pessimist guide to layer two. So in the second part, I'm gonna talk about specific attacks that, um, that we can make against um, payment and state channels, right? So there's two in particular that I want to talk about, which um, uh, I will call the stale, firstly, the stale state attack, and secondly, the unavailability attack. So first of all, the stale state attack. So in this, in this attack, um, Alice kind of, uh, it's, it's an attack where Alice submits old state and claims it's the latest states. So she submits this um, out of date thing, which, which has sequence number two and claims that it has, that is the latest state. So we know that from my description of how the smart contract works, we know that if Bob doesn't respond at the end of the challenge period, then the smart contract will actually go ahead and pay Bob eight ETH and pay Alice 12 ETH. Whereas the, the actual latest state is the one on the rightmost state. So in this case, um, uh, Bob has lost uh, seven ETH, right? So, so uh, a, a stale state attack can be kind of aggravated if you wait for gas prices to be naturally high, like if someone's running an ICO on the network or something. Um, it can be aggravated if you attack, if you are a, a counterparty in multiple channels and you, you do this attack against the many channels at the same time so that they all need to kind of do the dispute on chain and so on and so forth. Um, so the next attack um, is a bit more complicated to explain. Um, I'll call it the uh, unavailability attack. And this is something that's not discussed as much, um, but it applies against um, state channels. Um, and the definition of this is when one party refuses to sign valid state transitions. So I'll go through the mechanism of how this attack works. So we're back in this case where Alice and Bob want to uh, play a chess game off chain. So this is the latest state so far, and Bob makes a move, uh, sorry, yeah, Bob makes a move, and this is a legal move, like he moved his, um, he moved his knight or something. And for some reason, uh, the, the move is legal, but for some reason Alice um, doesn't sign it. So 
a plausible explanation is if Alice realizes that it's made into like in chess, no matter what she does, she's gonna lose the game. So, but let's say that for whatever reason she decides not to sign it. So, um, what recourse does Bob have in this case? Like, we can't just uh, let the game stop and say there's nothing he can do because that's not the terms of the contract. Like, um, the terms of the contract is whoever wins the game should get the money assigned to it. Um, in this case, like, um, uh, the, the only thing to do is for Bob to submit the latest state to, um, to the on-chain contract and make a claim of this form. Like, it's my turn to move and Alice isn't responding. So then in, now the blockchain can, the smart contract on-chain can uh, facilitate this unavailability, unavailability dispute um, by storing the states and, uh, right, okay, so, so this, is, this is my move, um, sorry. Yeah, in this specific case, um, this is the state where Bob is trying to make a move. So he puts it on chain, he submits his move, and then now he, the smart contract says, um, Alice, you have, let's say, five blocks to submit a response. And then the game continues like this. So um, in this, like, we, in this, this attack, basically, like we see that transactions happen on chain, so we can kind of measure how many transactions happen on chain and how much uh, fees need to be paid. So, like, if we, you can kind of see that if there's a, a main against two and your respond, and your opponent just kind of pretends to be offline, you need to enforce your like uh, your, your contract in this case against them. You need two on-chain transactions. If it's a mail in tree, it's kind of three on-chain transactions, et cetera. So the limit case is that by appearing offline, the counterparty can force basically your entire thing, your entire transaction to, um, to happen on-chain. So um, the next thing to talk about is kind of, you might wonder, well, given that this amount of fees need to be paid, can't we just make, um, can we just make uh, Bob pay for it? Sorry, can we just make Alice pay for it? And kind of the point of this, uh, this section is to uh, unpack that. So from the point of view of the smart contract on chain, um, all the smart contract sees is Bob making a claim of this form. It's my turn to move and Alice isn't responding. So we have to determine whether this statement is true. And so is Bob telling the truth? And the point I want to make is that we, there's no way of telling. Uh, it could be, Bob could be telling the truth and it's Alice's fault. Or maybe Alice is responding and Bob is simply pretending that Alice is not responding. So both of these situations look exactly the same to the smart contract. The only evidence they see is this picture I showed on the left um, where Bob is making this claim. So there's basically no way of knowing. And kind of the best we can do is maybe split the transaction fee between the two of them. And in this case, what happens is that um, our system exhibits what we call a griefing vector where Bob spends money to harm Alice because um, or, or Alice spends money to harm Bob, kind of like they pay one fee and f to kind of force the other person to fee, pay a, a fee as well. Um, and it's griefing because there's no direct benefit. In this case, um, you're just harming someone, but you, you're still gonna lose the chess game. So um, the third part of my talk is to kind of move away from specific attacks that we can conduct against um, the specific constructions I've outlined and think about um, describing layer two and layer one in a more holistic way and seeing what are their limits and what kind of attacks can be, con can be conducted against um, all layer two systems. So the first thing I, I want to do when um, to discuss this is, is to measure what exactly happens in the unavailability attack that I talked about here. So I'm gonna make a claim here that um, we, what we want to try to do is to think what is um, an oracle that we can that can resolve this dispute, right? So I'm going to claim that if we had access to an oracle with the following three properties, then we can it, we can solve this attack. So this oracle um, has the three properties that we can give it any piece of data. Um, anyone can access the oracle and upload data to it. Um, when you upload data, the data is downloadable by everybody and the Oracle truthfully answers questions about the time at which data was given to it. So um, if the, the, you guys can kind of figure out how, how this will solve the problem, but I'm, uh, I'm gonna go through it to, uh, for more clarity. So in this case, um, we'll, we end up in the situation I described before where um, 
Bob says, Alice, this is my move, but Alice pretends to be offline. So if we imagine there, there's this oracle and we think about how we can use it to solve the problem, um, um, Bob can put the data onto the oracle and then wait for like wait for amount of time, um, let's say 10 hours in this case. And so by the existence of this oracle, at, for the disputes, we can, Bob can now make stronger claims to the smart contract. So in this case, the claim he has to make is the same as before. It's my turn to move. Alice isn't responding. Um, but you can now make a stronger claim that I placed my move on Oracle and it was available for everyone, including Alice, to download. It was available for 10 hours. And Alice didn't place her corresponding move on the Oracle. And since we assume that this is uh, a magic Oracle that fulfills the three functions I talked about, the Oracle confirms this to the smart contract. And so now with this additional pieces of evidence, we can now distinguish the two cases that were indistinguishable before. And we can, and we can kind of place the blame on Alice and punish her for this bad behavior. Um, in this case, the, well, you know, let's say send all the money to Bob. So um, the point is that in a uh, state channel, um, and if, uh, in a state channel, for unavailability disputes in particular, the channels use the blockchain as this data availability oracle. So this kind of um, this kind of tells you why we need to think about um, like limits in terms of how L1 and L2 interact. So um, thinking about what services um, kind of layer one provides and what services in general we are trying to provide to people, right? We're trying to provide features like value transfer or smart contracts. Um, we're trying to pr provide these features in a way that behaves predictably, which means that there's no like kind of, um, there's some notion of finality um, and in a way that can always be accessed. Um, we pay for these features by cryptocurrency issuance or fees. And we have to pay for these features because there are incentives to, viol to violate them and we have to overcome these incentives by um, by, by paying fees. And furthermore, the, the, the blockchain and, and the validators that are validating it and the block producers are constrained by computation, uh, bandwidth, and storage. So the particular case I talked about for the unavailability dispute, um, it, um, that, that's what I refer to by uh, bandwidth. So bandwidth in this case is um, what I've heard called real-time data availability, which is the validators validating that, that the transaction data that is uploaded to the blockchain is actually available for everyone to download. So in Ethereum in particular, this, we pay for this by paying um, 68 gas for every byte of transaction data, every marginal byte of transaction data. Um, storage is kind of similar, except it's a long-term thing, and we want the blockchain to store and make data available over long periods of time, not just, not just in real time. Um, and this costs, this is the uh, S store op code in Ethereum. And kind of computation refers is uh, uh, basically everything else. So um, one of the points I want to make uh, with regard to this is that these resource constraints uh, interact in weird ways. For example, if you think about it, the unavailability griefing thing is an attack that only works against, um, only works against like uh, particular kinds of state channels. Like it works against a chess game, but it doesn't make sense to do this attack in a payment channel, right? So in this sense, um, the payment use case of transferring value um, and uh, the chess use case of uh, enforcing a chess contract on chain um, kind of use, like hits these constraints differently. And I'm gonna talk about two other, um, two other things that, that um, illustrate these resource constraints. Um, first one is layer two execution engines, and the second one is uh, storage exits, which is actually a uh, an attack that um, that all layer two systems have to like uh, can be done against all layer two systems. So, um, if you understand um, this breakdown of resources into computation, bandwidth, and storage, um, layer two execution engines are pretty simple to describe. Um, they're basically a way to like it's a scheme where you use verifiable computation, kind of like like um, which is computation where the cost to verify the computation is much lower than the cost to perform the computation. And you use verify, and for example, uh, certain types of snarks um, achieve this. So it's a way to use a verifiable computation to avoid paying uh, for computation, like avoid making every validator do the computation, but we rely completely on layer one for storage and bandwidth, 
right? So, that, for example, like um, these are these are some like uh, proposals and and things that kind of use this idea. Um, yeah, and the second thing I'll describe is um, storage exits. So. Um, going back to storage, which is one of the three uh, one of the three constraining uh, meter resources that I've talked about, um, like Ethereum blockchain today stores about um, two like I think it's I, I checked it's like two gigabytes of data of like state data. So, and we know that one of the use cases for blockchains is probably to, to so that people can store their data on it. Like there's inherent value in me being able to um, store some data somewhere and forget it and not having to carry my laptop or my phone around and having to and being able to download it at a later time right so let's just say that there's some inherent um, utility in storage in and of itself and imagine a situation where we store we have storage on layer one and a corresponding capacity of two gigabytes on layer one and um, a layer two that has a capacity and a utilization of that is much higher so the question in this case is um, is this a safe system because because um, in a layer two system, to design the secure, that we we it's it's the sec the security guarantee comes from the fact that we can kind of withdraw to layer one um, if anything goes wrong. So, but in this case, like for the specific case of storage, um, this is it's not going to fit, right? So, um, the question is: Is this safe? Um, does this attack work in practice? And it depends on assumptions. Like how likely is layer two to get attacked, and do we have any recourse in the case of attack other than to move to layer one? Um, yeah, the other two kind of limits that I'll talk about. Um, uh, the first one is um, yeah, uh, the first one is uh, liveness. So this kind of corresponds to the stale state attack that I was describing against payment channels. So successful attacks on layer one liveness result in reverting layer two safety. So if, for example, if I somehow, I mean, in the Alice and Bob um, payment channel, if, uh, Bob, if Alice broadcasts some stale state and then Alice attacks layer one liveness by preventing Bob, by like censoring Bob, they, she has kind of reverted layer two safety. So this is a problem in every design which uses in, like timeout-based interactive games. And it might cause a problem because layer one liveness seems easier to attack than safety. Right. Um, the last class of attack that um, I think applies against all of them is that a value holding layer two increases the profit profitability of attacking layer one. So um, this is kind of an attack that goes for all um, all valuable dApps. But um, the idea is that like like on layer one you have some incentive. Uh, every validator has some external incentive to violate the protocol rules. Um, but if there's a very pro uh, profitable layer two, um, the incentive gets stronger because they can steal more money. And it's compounded by one fact, which is that they are uh, permissionless. You just need to write a smart contract, and they can be designed not to play block to block producers' fees most of the time. So um, I, f I first heard this argument from uh, this particular tweet, which got some attention. And yeah, these are some stuff to think, think about. Um, Right, so um, there was a lot of stuff, um, and can, um, but kind of let's to get back to the to why I'm giving this talk. Like I like to say that I'm actually not such a pessimist. Like this was my attempt to outline what are some of the strongest attacks and limits that I know against layer two systems, and you should believe that I'm not a pessimist because I spend most of my time um, in my day job working on implementing these systems, and. The reason is that, for example, we didn't, um, some of the things that we didn't have time to talk about, we didn't cover all these speculative directions that kind of um, might be able to, to bypass some of these attacks that I've talked about. Um, and also, um, the attacks kind of show you that the, secure, the security analysis of layer two is very sensitive to the threat model. So the threat model includes like, what are the incentives of the attacker? Like what's their budget for attack? So like griefing is one example. Um, your your idea of security of the system is very different depending on whether you believe there exists motivated attackers who have, who have a large budget budget to attack you without without um, corresponding benefits to them, and and like it's very sensitive to their threat models and like 
in real real world kind of threat models, even weak incentives like a plasma operator's reputation, um, which basically means their future expected profit, can end up being very strong. And this is something that we haven't um, uh, we haven't talked about in this in this talk. Um, yeah. So these are some um, open questions that uh, I think researchers should pursue if if we want to answer questions like is layer two going to be a scalability benefit in the long run. Um, I've gone through kind of three of these. Um, throughout the course of my talk, um, there's there's many more. Um, I'm happy to discuss with um, anyone uh, after after this talk. So thank you. <laughs>